Rich Planet TV is sponsored by PrepperSafeHomes.co.uk you and your home against all forms of home invasion. Welcome to Rich Planet TV. I'm Richard D. Hall. Today I have returned to talk to the co-author of the groundbreaking, critically acclaimed multi-volume series covering British UFO sightings since 1940. Volumes 5, 6 and 7 have recently been released, which cover 1972 to 1979. Here to talk about Haunted Skies is John Hansen. Welcome, John. Welcome, thank you very much uh, Richard for uh, allowing me the opportunity to, to talk about the books again. Okay, now just the, 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 the last book that I mentioned there, Volume 7, you've actually published that yourself, just tell us about that. I, we decided to branch out uh, on our own, uh, sadly of course it meant um, terminating our uh, association with Mr John Downs, but uh, for which I'm extremely sorry for because we, we think the world of him and Karina and uh, as I said before, unfortunately, we could not afford to keep paying out. So I've set myself up as uh, Haunted Skies Publishing, okay. and effectively, I, I am now in control of, of these Right, books. so from Volume 7 onwards, and there's going to be quite a few volumes to take us up to the present day. <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> yes. Unfortunately, the I, number I of volumes hope, keeps growing. Yeah, yeah, I just hope that I can... Uh, <laughs> that I can live, live to, to, to that particular right. length of time to finish these right. damn things. Or because the, the project uh, keeps growing the, the more you're involved with it. As, as one makes various inquir inquiries about UFO reports from, from, uh, from the 1970s and 80s, there are always people that will telephone you and uh, tell you about uh, reports. So I mentioned to you before about the, the, uh, the letter in the National Association of Retired Police Officer magazine. It took me some time to get that in there, but appealing for any information, and we had quite a, a very good response right. from from uh, this is a recent venture. superintendents downwards who told us about right. sightings in, in the, the, the late 1970s and the 1980s, right. and, and further on. Now, um, you mentioned police officers, and you are an ex-police officer and ex-CID officer, so you investigate these cases through a police officer's eyes. Well, I investigate them with a large dollop of, of common sense, and right. uh, as we've discussed uh, before, uh, at the end of the day, you, you've got to make your own judgment on people. Um, so far, fairly all of the witnesses that I've spoken and interviewed seem, uh, a lot of them are very professional, they're sane, they're rational, and all they want to do, because a lot of them are very passionate about these, these sightings, mm -hmm. they just want to tell you what they've seen right. and make of it what you will. Right. And you're cataloguing that very comprehensively. I am because I think it needs to be catalogued because it, 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 it is part of, of a very important British social history mm -hmm. and, and really it, it is not about me, it's not about Dawn, but it's about the people. These, these things shouldn't be forgotten. And, and just to mention, John, um, typically this is, well, this is, I've got volume five here, which is 1972 to 1974, and right. you're talking a few hundred separate uh, UFO sightings in, in each volume. So you're talking right. thousands of cases, or it will be thousands of cases across the whole series. Well, that's the frightening part about it. It's that, uh, you know, contrary to the to, uh, recently expressed uh, public opinion mm -hmm. that, that UFOs once again are as dead as a duck in a water. Mm -hmm. Nothing, of course, could be could be more from from that. Yeah, and uh, and, and obviously some cases are evidentially strong, others not so. Well, that's right. But yeah. what but this we were discussing off camera that John's sort of um, objectives, if you like, are different than mine. John's trying to catalogue as many cases as he can both the, the the strong evidential cases and the weaker ones whereas I'm really interested in sort of the strongest evidence if you like. Uh, we both have yeah. the same goal but perhaps different 
yeah. our, our objectives. And I, I understand yeah. what you're saying. And uh, uh, although um, we didn't come to fisticuffs, <laughs> <such> <laughs> I understood yeah. what you were saying. So, and you're so quite right, of course. Uh, evidentially, uh, single witness sightings aren't always the strongest. Multi witness yeah. sightings are the best. Of course, Alan Hynek himself said that years ago. But at the end of mm -hmm. the day, you, and you are left with a lot of single witness sightings. And a lot of these sightings, they're not embellished. Yeah. They're straightforward accounts of pretty strange things seen in mm -hmm. the sky. And you have to form your own judgment on, the, on these people. But because uh, uh, what happened mm. was I wanted to cover two cases mm. from each of the latest three volumes and uh, we were sort of disagreeing on which cases we were going to choose. I think you were probably wanting to choose the more colourful cases, shall we say, whereas I wanted to choose well, the more multiple witness cases mm. with with just more plausible evidence. That's what I was looking at. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I know so we've kind of come to a compromise on what we're going to talk about. That's right. All right, well, let's um, start off with a case um, in 1973 in Kent, a UFO over Kent. Kent resident Peter Hildebrand. H Hildebrand and his friend John were fishing on the beach uh, at Grain in Kent on the 24th of November 1973 around midnight. Peter's friend brought his, his companion's attention to what he thought was a fishing boat out That's at right. sea yeah. about a mile away showing very bright light. Mm. So can you take it from there John? Okay well these guys were on the beach uh, and um, they were out fishing and uh, they saw uh, a light I in the sea that which they first took to be a fishing vessel uh, and then it advanced towards them, came up onto the beach and over the portable light they got, uh, enabling them to see a classic saucer shaped object. The object hovered over the portable light they'd got uh, and uh, it was clear that this wasn't a light, it was a saucer shaped object which then uh, moved off towards the direction of, of Sheerness mm -hmm. uh, and they lost sight of it. That always reminds me of a, a similar case at Sizewell uh, some years before where a, a similar sort of thing happened. The guy was out with his dog and this, this, this thing came out of the sea, hovered above them. Was there any sudden movements with this craft or was it just moving slowly? No, or? it was moving slowly as in fact most of these objects are. Again, um, a, a, a man contacted me about a similar incident when he was a young man out with his father in, in Ireland and he said this thing was next to the bush, saucer shaped object next to the bush four or, four, four or five feet off the ground mm -hmm. and it was making this ticking sound, tick, 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 ticking sound right. as if it was uh, it, as if it was some sort of creature or something right. and then it moved slowly away and, he, and his father confirmed that was what they'd seen. Do you think the disc and saucer um, type sighting has diminished since the 1970s and we're getting more triangle objects now would you say or not? Not necessarily because sometimes the, the saucer shaped object uh, can quickly take on the shape of a triangular shaped object. Right. And I do have reports of that bell-shaped object. We have a lot of bell-shaped objects seen in uh, in the Essex area. Certainly there was an upsurge of triangular U UFO activity and I really do detest that word because it's it's triangular except it's triangular in shape but sometimes it's triangular lights which are set at equilateral distance from each other um, and sh many people will refer to them as triangular but then if you go back into UFO history you'll see that a lot of people have described seeing three lights as mm -hmm. indeed Colonel Holt did at, uh, at Rendlesham mm -hmm. three lights in the sky and so th this this common denominator of three puzzles me All right. um, but then there's other cases where the black triangular object uh, moves over almost a shadow without any lights mm -hmm. sometimes it has lights in each corner and um, sometimes those lights will go out and a lot of people will think that it's gone but it is actually still there mm -hmm. so but it's, now, it's rich and varied isn't yeah. it trying. let's look at another case from Haunted Skies volume 5 and this time not specifically really a, a UFO encounter mm. um, just sort of high bizarreness if you like close encounters at RAF Alkenbury mm. just just tell us about Alkenbury and the strange things that have been witnessed there. Right, well, well Alcumbry, we had a, a number of airmen uh, contacts us one way or the other over the years and who'd served at Alcumbry and they, some of them had 
what you might call uh, paranormal experiences. Uh, I think on one occasion, uh, uh, somebody was doing some repair work inside an aircraft and he saw what others believed was a, uh, a humanoid, a hairy humanoid walking along the runway. This guy was really frightened. He was very traumatized by it. But eventually he told his colleagues about it. And other reports came from servicemen, retired servicemen, who'd been there. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually there was a, an intruder alert. And they'd um, confronted this, this being. This hairy this, humanoid. This hairy humanoid. Again, hairy humanoids. You know, your first impression is, <laughs> oh, this is funny, hairy humanoids. You know, shades of Dracula and werewolves. They can't exist, can they? But, you know, it's amazing how many people have seen them and they don't find it funny. They find it terrifying. Well, these guys saw this. Uh, this um, hairy humanoid. Uh, yeah, in, inside the uh, airbase. And they set the dogs on it. And the mm -hmm. dogs were so terrified they they peed in right. fright. So you've and got witness statements from these soldiers? Yeah, yeah. Right, okay. Well, ex, ex United ex. States Air Force personnel, or right. security police. Security police. And uh, they discharged their, uh, um, one of them discharged a pistol at it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if he was a good shot or bad shot or what, but this thing then just galloped over the, the, the fence and away it went into the nearby Monk's Wood. Right. Well, Monk's Wood is an area where we, uh, we, we carried out some investigation there and um, the, there'd been several strange things seen there, including monks, right. Od odd oddly, right. but, well not oddly, but monkswood is, is uh, I, I have no idea you know, why you can associate one phenomenon with the other, but I, I, I'm quite satisfied. Oh, tell us about um, this chap at Altenbury who was in the observation tower mm. and, he, and he heard chil yeah, that, that children's the voices. That, that, that's right. The, um, they were quite frightened because they, on, on the, the, these, these guys were in the observation tower, on, on the high tower, uh, on the uh, perimeter fence. And, um, you know, they were there on, on night shift and on, on one or two occasions they heard the sound of children's children talking and laughing very loud mm -hmm. uh, but it did certainly unnerve them because so just interrupt you there john is there any nurseries or no, schools no, anywhere near no 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 this is a middle so of the night a military camp yeah i right. mean there's no kids at three o'clock in the morning whatever it was right. and this didn't unnerve one and and the one man told us he wondered if it was to do with a um it was rumored that some children had been uh died in a train crash because there's a train line not too far away mm -hmm. Well, we managed to track down the uh, the actual um, report which had occurred in, I think it was 1898, mm -hmm. when the uh, Flying Scotsman was en route from past, past well it wasn't the base mm -hmm. then was it, but was, was en route and it broke down and then another train hit it and then another train hit it. Now I, I can't be 100% sure on what hit who, but it's all in the book. Mm -hmm. um, but sadly, uh, six children died, and it's quite chilling to read in that um, in, in that uh, Victorian journal. Mm -hmm. So this was in close yeah. proximity to where this tower it was. It was very close, yeah. Right. When I say very close, half a mile or something. If we if we just um, consider that evidence, assuming it's correct, assuming those children did die horrifically, and that person has heard this. What well, people immediately jump to, John, right, with that is, oh well, they were obviously ghosts, right? That, that's what people assume. Well, we can't, but we can't say that, no. can we? I, I mean, you no, and I know that but you can't say that. But if, if you I couldn't leave that out, you couldn't leave no. that evidence well, out. Let, let me just mm. let me just explain why I think people get the cart before the horse on what they what people right. think might be ghosts, right? Mm. I don't think modern biology has worked out how long-term human memory functions. Mm. There's nowhere in the brain where they can pin down where a long-term memory is held. Mm. Therefore, if you, if you look at the work of Rupert Sheldrake and people like that, yeah. they, they uh, s claim that the memories, long-term memory, is held outside of the mind. So if those children are having a horrific experience, they, have, they will have a memory of that b immediately before they've died. And perhaps mm. that memory is a very intense memory. So if that memory is not held in their grey matter and it's somewhere resonating in space, perhaps it's possible for someone to tune in 
to either a, a mm. memory or something which people refer to the Akashic record. Mm. And I think that we have to first understand really the, the, the true function of human memory mm. before we start saying uh, that was a ghostly activity. Do you see what I mean? That's yeah, where yeah, I, I come from I, on I, ghosts. I agree with you, uh, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm qualifying, uh, if you like, the investigation by saying that is what we found out. Uh, in Monkswood, there's, a, mm. there's some sort of government establishment. I think they make uh, the cultivate plants or something I uh, nothing high powered but mm -hmm. we spoke to the security guard there and he told us that people had seen um, shapes and, and mm -hmm. monks walking through the, the building and, and I'm not saying f that there may be no connection mm -hmm. at all but because yeah just one other point about that John that, that about when people generally mm -hmm. um, describe what they term as poltergeist type activity. Generally, if there's been a death, it's always, you, you generally find that it's someone who's died in a traumatic way mm. that, that yeah. It, it, yeah. so that for Sharp me, that, that might produce a more <laughs> resonant memory Something for someone to then tune into in the future. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm just hypothesizing here. I'm not saying that yeah. I'm right. What I'm saying is I don't think people who immediately say that's no, a it, ghost, it, it, yeah, you they, can't they do consider that, the yeah. evidence properly. You, as I say, you, you can't do that, can yeah, you? But yeah. a lot of people will do that. They'll they'll think there's a connection. Well, I'm not saying there is a connection. I'm just saying that the the, the evidence is that the guys have said they heard children's voices, and as you've said, there was there was there was no. We've agreed there was no nurseries. There was no schools mm. nearby. As far as I know, there was no children died in circumstances of suspicious circumstances, or whatever. Mm. We take that out the plot, but what we do know is that. That is that there was a train crash and that six mm -hmm. children and some adults lost their lives mm -hmm. and so who knows uh, yeah. you know I mean but some people will will say well we'll we'll, uh, we'll add it up and two and two comes to five and they're happy right. but yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know all right all right and John yeah. well uh, we'll talk more after this. Rich Planet TV is sponsored by PrepperSafeHomes.co.uk Your family and your home possible future civil unrest. 